Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is a Street Preacher's Corner podcast. The podcast where we occasionally mispronounce our own name. I realized on a previous recording that I called it something else. And, you know, it's one of those things where you had one job, but there you go. Well, folks, uh, as you can tell from the title, we're going to be starting our verse by verse uh, trip through the book of Mark with comparing scriptures. And, uh, I, you know, I'm going through this thing and, uh, you know, it's funny when you go teach verse by verse of the Bible, you try to, you try to cover everything, but in the history of Bible teaching, no one has ever covered everything that's in any, any one verse. Uh, every verse leads to other verses, every door opens other doors. So I'm going to do my dead level best using some notes that I already had, some other things I've looked at since then to go verse by verse through Mark and cover some things uh, that maybe you won't hear any, any, any place else. I, I don't know. I don't think, uh, I think if you're teaching something that no one else is teaching, and you're probably wrong, but uh, maybe it'll be the unique Street Preacher's Corner podcast take on things. But before I do that, uh, once upon a time, many, 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 many moons ago, I had a Sunday school teacher named Arthur Miracle, and uh, he was, uh, well, he's currently the pastor at New Hope Baptist Church of Santa Rosa, California, and um, he does things, he writes articles and does little things, you know, and uh, he'll send some stuff to me every once in a while. And so he took this, this letter he had written to a, a, a dad, a father, and he turned it into a, a article that he sent to me. And the name of the article is A Shot Across a Dad's Bow. I'm going to read this to you for your edification. Uh, so this is a letter that he wrote to a guy who had visited their church and the guy he had a conversation with after, that, after he visited that church. Thank you for the excellent time we spent together on your porch on Saturday afternoon. We enjoyed a stimulating exchange of ideas. I hope you found it as profitable as I did. I was disappointed, though not overly surprised, that you did not attend our services the following day, Sunday, as you promised, nor on the Sunday after that. I was very much looking forward to seeing you with us. I ask you to read carefully Hebrews 10, verse 23-31. You have upon you the awesome responsibility of fatherhood. Whether your children will spend eternity in heaven or in the lake of fire will be largely determined by whether you as their father can successfully lead them to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Notice that I said nothing about getting involved in a religion. Religion is poison to the soul. Jesus hates religion as the word has been understood and promoted throughout human history. And religion hates the true Christ. Religion put Jesus on the cross and to this day it blocks millions from his saving grace. I emphasize this point because you made a strange reference to the quote-unquote Baptist religion, which revealed you neither understand your Baptist heritage nor comprehend what religion truly is. Religion is man striving to reach God, which is the antithesis of the biblical teachings that are promoted by Baptists. The true gospel is that God came down to man in the person of Jesus Christ, lived sinlessly amongst us, offered that pristine life as the ultimate sacrifice to pay for our sins, died in horrible agony and shame upon the cross, was buried in a tomb, but rose from the dead after three days and three nights had expired, so he can now offer himself to you as a perfect Savior. You boast about your spiritual savvy, while in fact you reveal little in the way of actual biblical understanding. Your parents and your former pastors and teachers will have much to answer for if if they're personally responsible for your woeful ignorance on spiritual matters. But if they did their jobs well and taught you Bible truth, you yourself will have to answer to God for failing to hear and heed their instruction. If your children do get saved, and I sincerely hope they will, there is still the matter of the judgment seat of Christ that they must face. Every believer will give an account of his life following his salvation. Will your kids receive any rewards to show for their service to Christ in their lifetimes? Will they have to you to thank because you caused them to be raised in a solid Bible preaching and teaching church, reinforcing at home what they were learning there, and getting involved within the Lord's work? Or will they have you to blame because your spiritual lukewarmness compromised their opportunity to grow, quote, in the nurture and admission of the Lord, which was your responsibility as their father to provide them? It's my job to ask the question. You'll need to provide your own answer. You challenge me about topics that I should be preaching about. I will prayerfully consider your suggestions. But let's be honest about this. Based on spending one Sunday morning in our church, you figure you've sized me up and you've put me in a certain pigeonhole in your mind. You want to know why you don't hear preaching about things that involve your needs, such as how to face financial difficulties, how to handle personal pressures, how to raise kids as a single father, etc., etc. I have three responses you need to carefully consider. First, everything you mentioned I've preached about one time or another, 
and all those topics with many other more besides will be handled again in the future. The Bible has all the answers we need for life. The real question is, will you be here to receive that instruction when it is provided? Will you be here when I preach on finances, parenting, including the thorny issues involved raising teens, and living victoriously through life's many pressures? Second, even though I've never met your former pastors and teachers, I'm convinced that everything you so desperately need to know now in your life, God had already revealed through their Bible preaching and teaching while, we, while you were young, before you had made so many grievous errors and created so many disasters for yourself. Either you weren't listening, or by your own sad testimony, you simply weren't there to receive what they'd prepared for you. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Third, you're only facing these overwhelming pressures because you turned your back on the little you did learn. You left the guidance and protection of your pastor and your church, and you still seem to be running away from spiritual authority. You have ignored the admonitions of the Word of God married outside the will of God. You blew that marriage because you had not built your life on spiritual principles. Now you're in an ongoing mess because you're not the man God had wanted you to be. The Lord sought to advise you. Quote, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understand the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Nevertheless, you have a Savior who is gracious. He is waiting to welcome home the prodigal. He sent me to this church to help you. If you refuse that help, the burden and responsibility is on you. You can answer the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, if in fact you're born again, or at the great white throne judgment, if, as I fear, you're not yet truly saved. This is the kind of letter that divides the men from the boys. You can accept the rebuke and get right with God, or you can hate me and reject everything I have to say. I'll know that you made the first choice, the wise one, if I see you again in our church services. I'll be praying for you. Your life thus far is a tragedy that God wants to transform into a victory for His glory. But you'll have to play the game by His rules, or you will continue to be the loser. Well, Art, why do you hold back so much? Why don't you tell them what you really think? And now onward to the gospel according to Mark. Verse 1, chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. Now, that, that phrase, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is, um, that, that's, a, that's a very important phrase. Well, actually, that's an important phrase. Also, the, the important phrase is, as is written in the prophets. Now, now this is the beginning of the the document of Mark's gospel, but the, the this document isn't the beginning of the gospel. Um, let me explain. The gospel is defined in First Corinthians fifteen as the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. Anything that, that departs from that is a false gospel. So, for example, when the Mormons say it's the gospel plus you try your best. That's a false gospel. Uh, when the Roman Catholic Church says it's the gospel plus sacraments, that's a false gospel. When the Church of Christ says gospel plus baptism, that's a false gospel. Just so you have, a, you know, just so we're clear on what we're talking about here. But the uh, the plan of redemption, God's plan of redemption, that that culminates at Calvary begins much much earlier. Actually, turn in your Bibles to Revelation thirteen. Revelation 13 looks like we're going to be in verse, that ain't right. It's terrible when you write the wrong, the wrong verse down. Let's try Revelation 3. Let's see if it's there. Nope, not there either. All right, we're, we're doing great. The verse I was looking for was the, the one where it says the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, and uh, I could look and I don't I don't know where it's at. Um, for uh, maybe five. Man, this is this is off to a, a rousing start, isn't it? Well, there's a verse somewhere in Revelation that says that uh, that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. And my point in all that was that the plan of redemption that begins, that ends at Calvary or the, that, that culminates or climaxes at Calvary began much, much earlier. Look at Colossians 1. Colossians 1. Those of you that enjoyed the uh, 
church kid interviews. There are more coming. Uh, it's got to get some church kids to cooperate. Uh, here we go. Uh, Colossians 1 verse 18. This is the he here is speaking of Jesus Christ. We can back up for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So Jesus Christ uh, is the, in, in his personage, in his, in his role as, as, as the Redeemer, in his role as the Son of God. He is, he is the beginning of the gospel. He is the first begotten of the dead. Uh, but let's look at another verse here, Second Thessalonians. You say, I thought we were marked. Oh, yeah, we were marked for like three minutes, man. We're off, we're off the races now. Second Thessalonians, you know, so you know, the, the the scriptural me- method of uh, of studying scripture will very rarely leave you in one place for very long. And one of the things that's hard for people to understand about the Bible is that the the information of the Bible is not written uh, really in the way that that people would write it if they if they wrote something like this. It is scattered all throughout and. Um, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna find if you're gonna do a study on baptism, you're you're not gonna find it's all not in one place. It's scattered everywhere, and it's the same for everything else in the Bible. Second, that's what I say. I said Second uh, Thessalonians two, verse thirteen. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, always to God for you, brethren, beloved Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you as salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit. And a belief of the truth. Now, this is one of those verses that a, that a Calvinist, and I'm not I'm not opposed to Calvinists. I'm a, I, I, I know some; they're not bad folks. Um, the, a, a, this is one of those ones that a Calvinist will take and run run to town on. But in my opinion, they misread it. See, it doesn't say God chose you for salvation; it says God chose you to salvation. See, verse thirteen isn't about who He chose; it is about the process. In other words, how does a man get saved? Well, man gets saved through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. God didn't choose you. He chose the method. And whoever avails himself of the method uh, receives salvation as a free gift. Here, I'll show you. Uh, Look at Matthew 12. Matthew 12. I do believe a lot of Calvinism is um, a grammatical issue. I believe the verses on predestination, the verses on election, I think if you take those sentences and you diagram them out like you were told how to do in, told how to do in third grade English class, um, you'll find out that they don't say what they you think they say and they don't teach what you've been taught they teach. So anyway, Matthew 12, what I said, verse 14. Uh, yeah. So then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. And he charged them that they should not make him known that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved and whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. So in here, uh, Matthew uh, through the Holy Spirit, Matthew quotes a verse out of the Old Testament, and he says that this this incident here is is uh, is the fulfillment of that of that prophetical thing, and the verse he's quoting uh, is in Isaiah forty two. So we're going to run over there and look at what it actually says. Behold, my servant. This is forty two verse one. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, and whom my soul delighteth. I put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgments to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard on the street. Uh, in the street, a bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not dis- uh, quench. He shall bring forth judgment and truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged. See, that that Isaiah 42 is about Jesus Christ. And according to Matthew 12, uh, God chose Christ. He didn't choose you. He chose Christ. And everybody who is also, who is in Christ is also chosen. Jesus Christ is the elect, and anyone else who is in Christ is the also the elect by, you know, by association with him. So how do you get in Christ? Well, it's right there in 2 Thessalonians. Sanctification of the Spirit 
and belief in the truth. Now, none of this, that I, this, this, this thing that I just said has nothing to do really with verse one. Verse one is just, you know, here's the beginning of my gospel. So back to Mark. The, the, you know, we're going to get more into this uh, later, but, but you, you'll see that the gospel goes back all the way back to the beginning of, of this whole thing. Mark 1. I've got this little cardboard box thing, and every time I try to flip my Bible page, it hits the ear of the cardboard box and slows me down. Back to Mark 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as, as is written in the prophets. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Now, it's worth mentioning that verse 1 and verse 2 are the same sentence. I took some liberty there because I wanted to talk about where the gospel began. Uh, but uh, it's the same sentence. And it, it, it makes the case that this thing we call the gospel uh, was not only the result of the counsel and the foreknowledge of God, but was also prophesied before it happened. See, there, there's a there's a there's a a philosophy or a mindset or or I don't know I don't know what you would call it an idea out there that you hear about every once in a while that that almost like the church was Plan B, like like Jesus's original plan was to offer a kingdom to the to the Jews. Um, and then when they rejected, it says he came into his own, his own received him not, but, the, but to them that received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe upon his name. The idea is 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 promoted uh, that that sort of the, the church, the Gentile church, if you want to call it that, or a church of anyone who'd receive Christ. It's not a Gentile church; it's a it's the church. Um, that, that that the church was like Plan B. But according to the scripture we just read, uh, the church wasn't a backup plan. It wasn't plan B. It was the plan, quote, from the beginning. How far back? Well, we said that we saw that it was uh, uh, all the way back from the foundation of the world. Bo, if you want a rabbit to chase, uh, if you want a rabbit to chase, you should look at the, the definitions of the, um, of the world and the earth. So when it says the foundation of the world, that's... Not Genesis 1. Oh, where's that verse at? There's a verse over in Chronicles. Well, anyway. Just just run the references, okay? I, I, I can't... I, I, I got to draw a line somewhere. I have great liberty here because I, I don't have a timeline set on how long it's going to take us to get through Mark. And, and guys that feel like they got to rush through a book, I've never understood that because, uh, you know, what else are you going to do? Get done with this book, you're going to cover another one. So let's just, you know, take your time. Genesis 3, the Bible says, uh, this is the fall of man. And it says, uh, Lord God, verse 14, the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We can talk about when that happens, or when, what we're not going to do that right now. I just want you to see that from the very as soon as man falls, man falls like eight or nine verses earlier, you know, than that. And as soon as as man falls, uh, God is right there with a plan to fix all this. And according to the to the Revelation verse that I could not find, um, that 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 solution was was laying there, just waiting to be implemented. I guess however however you want to however you want to think that works. Um, and so God doesn't give all the details right here, but it suffice to say, he says to the man, to the woman, the snake, everybody's there. Uh, he tells them uh, that it's enough to know that the seed of the woman is coming and the seed of the woman, when he comes, is going to fix all this. So as, as, as history plays out, God reveals more and more and more and more about this plan he has. And look at Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7, God did not just wake up one morning and say, hey, a cross. No, no, this was, this was from day one, this was what was going on. Uh, let's see, verse of uh, Isaiah 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. 
Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both their kings. Maybe I'll tell you one day about the how about the 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 the, the spiritual crisis that this passage right here caused me, but not today. So we know the seed of the woman is coming. We know from Isaiah uh, 7 that he's going to be born of a virgin. And if you turn just a couple pages over to Isaiah 9, there's another crucial piece of information. Verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So there's a baby coming, the seed of the woman, going to be born of a virgin. That's pretty, that's good to know. That that sort of, you know, culls him from the rest of the herd. And when that baby comes, he's not just going to be a baby. He's going to be God manifesting the body of flesh. It's a lot of information to have. It doesn't give you a timeline, but you know something's going to happen. Look at Genesis 49. And we're not going to cover all these because that's a study in and of itself. I just want to establish for just people that have never have never thought this through. Um, the redemption of mankind is such a big deal to God, and 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 your salvation is so intricate and so well thought out that it took millennia to get everything in place. That's why the Bible calls it uh, the fullness of time. Genesis forty nine, the Bible says in verse ten, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver between his feet, until shall come, and unto him shall be the gathering of his people be. So we know that there's a baby coming, the seed of the woman. We know that baby will be born of a virgin. We know that baby will be born, uh, um, uh, he will be, he'll be God manifest in the flesh. And we know that he'll be of the tribe of Judah. That's a lot to know. We know some more things. We look at Song of Solomon. When this baby shows up, who is God manifest in the flesh, he's going to need a couple things. When you sit down and read Luke 2 and, and, you know, what people will call the Christmas story. We'll say, we'll say the Advent story because that's probably more accurate. No, it's definitely more accurate. Um, there's a lot of elements in that that you don't even appreciate that are happening, that are lining up, that unless you've read the other parts of the Bible and you understand uh, this stuff, then, 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 then there's a lot of pieces that fall into place. Song of Solomon, uh, verse 6. Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness? And I'm, we can back up here. It's, it's it, This is a typology of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 6. Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense with all powders of the merchant? So when this child, who is God manifest in the flesh, who is born of a virgin, when he arrives out of the tribe of Judah, he's going to need some myrrh and he's going to need some frankincense. So if you're going to come see him so you can worship him, Get on his good side. Bring the stuff he needs, right? I mean, Numbers 24. Actually, let's, let's, let's do this other one first. Let's go to Daniel 9 first. Daniel 9. Daniel 9 is crucial. I say I say it's crucial like, like the rest of the Bible isn't. But this is an important verse, and I don't know that, that uh, most people give it a whole lot of thought to. Daniel 9. The Bible do say in verse... 25, this is a prophecy of what we call Daniel's 70 weeks. Uh, great study. Good luck with that. If you figure some stuff out, let me know. Uh, but here we go. Uh, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon that people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. Verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem under the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times troublous times and after three score and two weeks shall messiah be cut off but not for himself and the people of princes shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be the flood and under the end of the war desolations are determined there's so much in there but here's what i want you to understand there is a timeline given the clock starts running you, you're given a timeline from a a a soon to happen event to the death of the messiah not the birth of the messiah the death of the Messiah says he'll be cut off. And we know from other verses that that's, that's a reference to, to Calvary. So 
so you know, once uh, the, the decree goes out to rebuild Jerusalem, um, to restore and build Jerusalem, then you've got a certain amount of time before your Messiah dies. Okay? So you know, and you know how many years it is. It tells you how many years it is. So, so once King Cyrus, whose name, by the way, is prophesied that he's going to be the king to, to, uh, to, to, to do that, once, once King Cyrus sends out that decree, then the clock is running, right? Um, now there's lots of other prophecies, but for, I mean, let's just, let's just think for a second. For a man to be crucified, for a man to die, he has to be born first, right? I mean, he has to grow up. He has to, and so, so you know that it's uh, 483 years, what it is, uh, between the cut, between the, the between uh, Calvary, or between the, 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 the decree by Cyrus and Calvary. So you know if you if you understand the prophecy and you, you're paying attention, uh, you know that you've got some waiting to do. You know uh, when when that uh, when that pro- when that declaration goes out, you know that you're not going to see the Messiah in your lifetime, and you know that your kids are not going to see the Messiah in their lifetime, and you know several 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 generations are going to go by without the Messiah manifesting himself. You know when he's going to die. You don't know when he's going to when he's going to be born. You see what I'm saying? But you know. I mean, people that were paying attention could count back and they could say, well, we are a hundred years away from the Messiah dying because we are 365 years or 360, whatever the number is, 363 years away from the rebuilding of Jerusalem. You could count it down from the, re, the decree to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem to, to, and you could know you're getting close, but you don't know how close you are because you don't know. I mean, you know, he's got to be born, but you don't know how old he is when he dies before it happens. Right. So how do you know? How do you know when the Messiah shows up on the scene? Numbers 24. How do you know when you're getting close? Numbers 24. See, there's a, there's a timer, there's a countdown going on. Numbers 24, verse 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star, capital S, out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. So you know the appearance of this Messiah on the scene is accompanied by a star. So the reason the wise men uh, saw a star uh, is because they were looking for it. I mean, they, they can count. They know that, you know, you, you got to have, I mean, somewhere within 60 years before, um, somewhere in 320 something years after the, after the, after the, the decree goes forth to rebuild Jerusalem, you know, you're getting close. And every year goes by, you know, you're getting closer and probably 30 years, or, you know, uh, before the, the, the crucifixion, you're, you're looking around pretty tight and you're watching for this star that's supposed to show up. And you know, these guys knew uh, that when the Messiah was born, they were going to see a star and they knew to bring gold and frankincense and myrrh because they, that, that's the reason they brought it because they knew that's what to bring. Now, nobody had this all figured out. It is amazing to me personally. Um, but look at Matthew 2. So these guys, these wise men, and yes, almost every manger scene you've ever seen is wrong. And I say that because I'm the guy that wants to ruin everybody's fun. That's not really it. Uh, now Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. As, a, as an aside, we know they came from the east. They saw the star in the east. Uh, I had a guy tell me that couldn't possibly be true because if they were in the east and they saw the star in the east and they followed the star, then they would wind up, you know, Going or going east, and they would have gotten further away from Jerusalem. It says they were from the east, and they saw the star in the east, which means they were in the east when they saw the star. Not that the star was in the east. See, grammar is a thing, man. Grammar is a thing. Syntax, sentence structure, all very important. Um, they were, you know, it's like me saying I saw a star in Woodbine. Uh, well, that doesn't mean, you know, that's what it means. You know, I'm from Woodbine, and I saw a star in Woodbine, and so here I am. It's kind of thing, but anyway, so 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 uh, so they knew they knew 
to look for him. They knew uh, the time, the rough timeline. They knew to look for the star. They knew to follow the star. They knew what presents to bring, but they didn't know where he was going to be born at. Now you could say, well, how in the world are these guys living in the East? How did they, how did they, uh, how did they have access to all this information? I mean, I mean, you know, one of my things is, is that not everybody uh, in the world had the scriptures. Um, but these guys apparently did because everything I gave you, everything they knew to do was out of the, the Old Testament scriptures. So I have a theory and all of this is, a, all it is is a theory. Um, uh, everything I've given you as far as prophecy goes, every verse I've quoted you, uh, I've quoted you Song of Solomon, I've quoted Daniel, I've quoted uh, Genesis, uh, Isaiah, uh, well, Numbers. Um, all that stuff is, <clears throat> well, this is specific. Solomon, apparently, if you look at the, the things that went through his court, Solomon was trading all over the world. There were, there were, there were things coming from the four corners of the globe, um, to his, to his, to his kingdom, through his kingdom, they were buying them, they were selling them, they were trading them. And so I believe that they were also exporting things all, all over the world. And I believe that they, um, that they exported scriptures. Can't prove it. It's a theory. That's why, uh, Nebuchadnezzar knew what the son of God was going to look like, uh, because he had scripture. Just a thought. Probably dwelt on that longer than I had to. But anyway, nobody had all this figured out, not even the wise men, because they did not know where he was going to be born. So, so, so God gives all these prophecies, and you see prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. You get to the end of Malachi, and God just goes silent. God goes to radio silent for, I think it's 400, 400 years. And, um, and the children of Israel are there. They're in the land, except when they're not. And they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting for their Messiah to come. And those of them that can count and those of them that cared were marking off the years. And they have, uh, they're reading scriptures that point to the Messiah. And they're doing religious um, exercises that point to the Messiah. They're keeping laws and traditions and holidays that all point to the Messiah. And the clock just runs. And the clock just runs. And the clock just runs. And it looks like that by the time the Lord actually is born, uh, not a whole lot of people are looking for him anymore. All the traditions, all the the scriptures, all the practices that were supposed to point to the Messiah had become a thing that they they wrapped themselves in for their own self righteousness that they used to prove that they were better than the nations around them. Uh, they were they were in a mess when he showed up. But not not everybody had forgot to look for the Messiah because the wise men showed up. But there's another guy that's, that's very interesting to me, Luke two. I mean, my country, tis of the sweet land of liberty. No, that's not where I was going. My country is, uh, you know, 1776 to whatever year this is. And uh, so 200 and change years. Um, that's not very old. I mean, you go over to Europe and there's, you know, they've got still got buildings that are old. They've got buildings that are still using that are older than everything in America. Um, but we're talking 400 years of silence where God, all you have is, you know, Genesis to Malachi, and God hasn't said anything new to anybody, and nobody isn't even alive who had got any 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 scriptural revelation from God. But apparently, God was still talking to individual people. Look at Luke two, verse twenty five. I'm getting there. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and that same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. This is one of those guys that just shows up and then disappears back into the scripture. You don't know nothing about the guy, except these two or three verses here. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. So he's quoting parts of Isaiah 42. Joseph and his mother marveled at the things which were spoken by, of, of him. 
Simon blessed him and said in Mary's mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. And you go on there, and there's another lady, uh, uh, Anna. And uh, so there were some people that were waiting on him. And because they were bothered to wait on him, God had given them a little heads up. Hey, you get down to the temple. Because you're fixing to see the thing that I promised you to. But for the most part, people didn't care. For the most part, people weren't looking for him. For the most part, people had settled into their daily lives and it had become religious tradition. It had become just a thing. Okay, so so we know that... Uh, um, that once the star shows up, we know the Messiah is born. Think about this. Okay, so shepherds abiding in their field by night, right? And they're out there doing their, their shepherd thing. And uh, they uh, so the angels come up and say, you know, hey, the Messiah is born. He's he's in Bethlehem. Get down there, look at him, find him. Da, da, da. So you're the shepherds and you run down there to, to Bethlehem and you find the thing. You follow the star. Is what it says in Luke two, and you follow the star and we're into the manger where the, where the baby is there, and oh my goodness, the Messiah is here, the constellation of Israel is here, the promised one, God manifest in the flesh, is right here in this manger. I cannot believe God has graced us uh, uh, to to let us see this thing that the Bible says that angels have diligently inquired after, and that great men of old, great prophets of old, wanted to see but didn't, and so the baby is there, and you're one of the shepherds, and you go. Okay, now what? Right? I mean, he's a baby. He's a kid. Well, what do you got to do? You got to wait some more. You got to wait for him to get out of diapers. You got to wait for him to learn to walk. You got to wait for him to learn to talk. You got to wait for him to learn uh, uh, subjection, uh, to, to learn things by the things he suffered. You've got to wait for him to grow in wisdom and stature before God and before man You've got to wait. So how do you know? You as a people have been waiting for this since Genesis 3. As a race, you've been waiting for this since Genesis 3. As a people, you've been waiting for this since the, since the establishment to rebuild Jerusalem. Well, how do you know that this is, that, that we're, okay, so now now we're at the end of this thing because because the baby's born, the star's here, the baby's born. But now the baby's born, how do we know when we're getting to the very, 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 very end of this? Well, the way you know that the curtain is going up on the last act of this plan um, isn't the appearance of a star but the appearance of a herald Malachi 4 I mean you're one of the shepherds those guys got old I, mean, I don't know how old they were when they when they found the star but they you know let's say they were 20 well they're 50 by the time this thing gets rolling really you know they, oh yeah 50 yeah, thirty years ago we saw this. We saw this. This the Messiah be born, and now we're just we're getting up every morning under Roman rule, waiting for this the next thing to happen. How do we know when the next thing happens? Or what is our what is our indicator? Uh, Malachi four. Behold, I will uh, verse five. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the father or heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children of the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So we're going to take a one quick more peek here. We're coming in for a landing here. So there's a herald going to show up. We're going to go back to Mark 1, and we're going to reread the verses that we just read in, in light of everything else we just read. Mark 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which will prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare you the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. When John shows up, you know you are at the last minutes, last hours, the last days of the Messiah coming and being cut off. And if you're paying attention, you live in back then, and you're paying attention, you have the opportunity to be extremely well informed about what's going to happen next. So next time, we're going to talk about this herald. We're going to talk about John the Baptist. Very unusual fella. Uh, there's a lot that goes on with him. And we're going to get into his message. And we're going to get into what it meant. We're going to get into what it did not mean. Uh, we're going to poke uh, at some cults. And we're going to have a good time. We're going to make fun of Martin Luther King Jr. It's going to be great. Uh, so please, by all means, uh, you know, uh, come back. I, I, don't like and subscribe. Who cares? Come back. And hear what more the Bible has to say. Well, guys, this is Mike Alford. 
signing off, and I will see you on the other side.